Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening. I'm Yvonne Steff for Science for the Public and I welcome you to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Tonight our distinguished guest is John Beckwith, American Cancer Society Research Professor of Microbiology and Molecular Genetics at Harvard Medical School. <clears throat> Dr. Beckwith's lab was the first to isolate and clone a gene from a bacterial chromosome. This was in 1969 and it was a crucial breakthrough in genetic science, introducing, for example, the potential to control genes associated with inherited diseases. However, the Beckwith group realized that there were also darker possibilities in gene manipulation and they expressed that concern directly. At his 1969 press conference announcing the isolation of the gene, Dr. Beckwith warned that scientific and public vigilance would be necessary to prevent the negative potential of genetic engineering. And since that time, he's been an unrelenting voice for ethics in genetic engineering. The isolation of the gene at the Beckwith lab was followed with a number of other major accomplishments, including the discoveries of the switches that turn genes on and off, protein folding in cells, and the mechanisms of protein transport both inside the cell and going out of the cells. Throughout his distinguished career, Dr. Beckwith has coupled his scientific work with uh, social activism aimed at raising awareness of the potential misuse of genetic research. For decades, he's been a vocal critic of reductionism in genetics, that is, the tendency to ascribe to an individual's genes complex characteristics such as intelligence and behaviors such as criminality. We'll hear about some surprising examples of this problem tonight. Dr. Beckwith was a member of the Ethics Committee of the Human Genome Project in the 1980s, and since 1983, he's taught a course called Social Issues in Biology at Harvard University, one of the first of its kind. Today, he's a member of the Genetic Screening Study Group, which he'll tell us about as well. Dr. Beckwith has received many awards for his work, including the Abbott ASM Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Society for Microbiology and the Selman Waxman Award in Microbiology from the National Academy of Sciences. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences also. It is a very great honor to welcome Dr. John Beckwith. Welcome, Thank you. sir. And we'll start in, if you will, with giving us some uh, background, how you got into this field in the first place, which was odd. <laughs> I think in my <clears throat> early days of my career, I was basically carried on by what I did best in my classes mathematics, chemistry, et cetera. Um, but at the same time, I, when I was an undergraduate in college, I took many courses in literature and other fields mm -hmm. other than science. And I ended up <clears throat> graduating feeling, having mixed feelings about continuing in science, but I basically let myself be carried on to the, what the, the normal path to follow was. Mm -hmm. And I got into graduate school in chemistry and I started to get even more uh, concerned about whether this is what I really wanted to do. Uh, but during graduate school, I discovered the work of some geneticists, which I knew nothing about beforehand because I had never taken a genetics course, mm -hmm. which really blew me away. I was really uh, overwhelmed with it. They were French scientists mm -hmm. who had um, not only done amazing work with very creative, almost magical kind of findings, uh, but at the same time, they wrote very beautifully, yeah. and uh, it just carried me along uh, into my career, which I hadn't necessarily expected was going to last. Um, so for 
several years I made an effort and finally succeeded at finding a position in that laboratory in France was where the work had been done. That was, that wasn't Monod. Uh, was well, it was, there were the two French scientists right, right. were, uh, there was a bigger group, but right. uh, Francois Jacob yeah. and Jacques Monod who made basically fundamental discoveries that are the lore of original uh, yeah. findings in molecular biology that really opened up the field of biology yeah. for, along with two or three other important findings. Right. Uh, yeah. So you made your way into it in, in that manner. And then how did you end up at Harvard in, in the medical school? Um, I was in graduate school and then in, at Harvard. Then I went to do postdoctoral work in various places. Yeah. Uh, and at some point, I wasn't even sure I was going to find a job. I was still trying to get <laughs> to, into this French laboratory. Um, and at the same time I was finally accepted, I was offered a job at Harvard Medical School because my work became right. known at that yeah. point. Um, so I took the job because I didn't have any other offers, so <laughs> that's but why I ended up there. On the other hand, now that, that, was, that couldn't have been when you discovered the error in the, mono, the right. genetic switches right. error. So can you tell us about that? Because <laughs> not many people just starting out come up with something right. like that. Well, I was working at, um, with a professor as a, my first postdoctoral fellowship at Princeton University. I see. And he had started a project which was very much based on the, the French scientists' work and accepting that it was all, the theories and the ideas were all correct. Did uh, they, had they gotten the Nobel Prize for this? No, they, they didn't get okay. the Nobel right, Prize. Excuse me, yeah. Quite a few, maybe six or seven years later. Okay. And, um, so I started on the project and I just got some very peculiar results. It didn't make any sense and this, this doesn't fit with my idols' yeah. <laughs> theories. There's something funny here. And I worked al along with it until it became clear that in a kind of small aspect of their work they'd made a, a significant misinterpretation of their results. Um, so in a way I didn't find something new I had found something that disproved something that mm -hmm. well-known scientists had done, and that's enough to make one famous. Oh, too, I think so, I think. because yeah. you, that was sort of overnight, and yeah. as I say, I don't know that, how many people start out like that, uh -huh. you know, yeah. because that was, uh, that was sort of a, a groundbreaking thing all by itself. But in any case, you went on it, and you, you set up a lab at Harvard, and immediately got famous uh, again. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us please something about the isolation of the gene? What that was such a big thing there uh, in its technical aspects? Well, it's funny. Um, people did, there's no discussion of isolating genes because nobody had thought of a way mm -hmm. to do it and I don't know how many people were thinking of it and in fact when I look back, particularly in preparing for this interview, I realized that we actually had the tools for doing it four years before we did it. We didn't oh, realize. You didn't know you could do it. We didn't even realize it. It, it came about, it's complicated how it right, came about, right. but we discovered we had these uh, bacterial viruses that carried the, bac the lac genes from the yeah. bacterial chromosome, which I had actually work I had done when I was with the French uh, scientists. That's, that was their thing, the lac. And took that back to start my lab yeah. with. And a few years later, we isolated another, another one of these viruses carrying these particular genes. And that actually made it easier for us to realize we could do that, make a pure gene. Right. But it's, I think it's kind of a question where people weren't even thinking about it because the tools weren't imaginable at that time. But once we had done this, then people came up with better and better techniques and just, it's been moving on ever since it, then. Yeah, um, right. Within three years of our isolation of this pure gene, a technique that made it very much easier to cut pieces of chromosomes into small pieces that were gene size pieces and, and use them was developed. And then our 
our method was no longer useful. Right. Yeah. But now, today, you don't even think about this. It's amazing that it was, it was such a big step at yep. that time. And again, yep. that was, it was, at least you announced it in 1969. So it was mm -hmm. 1969, and uh, this is sort of, a, a field is still really developing at this yeah. time, right? So uh, it was a, a different thing. Now, you went from there. I mean, you had one thing after another in this magical lab, and you trained a number of very well-known scientists, correct? So what else did you do in there that was? Um, actually, uh, in those early days, we, we actually went from this, this issue of the mistake that, that the French co-workers had made, yeah. uh, because they were defining a particular site that was an important site for turning genes on, and they had mistakenly misplaced it in the map of how the gene works. And so we went on to actually get mutations that affected that site in the, in the chromosome and were able to define it very specifically. And that settled that question. Right. Um, after that, I um, got interested in moving on to more complex problems in biology. And the next major area we went into was how so bacteria are cells with cytoplasmic membranes that surround them. Yeah. And they often secrete certain proteins out of the cell into the surrounding media. Or in bacterial infections, they secrete proteins into human cells or, or whatever animal they're f affecting. And we were very interested in what, uh, what's the process that the mm -hmm, cell uses mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to move a protein that's being made inside the cell to outside the cell. And again, we use genetic approaches to isolate mutants that cause defects in that process. And this allowed us uh. to specify features of the, both the proteins and the cell that allowed this to happen. I see. So, and then with that work, uh, a number of people also became very famous. So this, this is a big deal in this mm -hmm. lab. Now, over the years, in say zooming up to more recent years, <coughs> is there anything that you are uh, are working on or have worked on more recently that is of great interest to you? Yes, um, Good. it's keeping me very busy now, <laughs> which uh, I didn't expect. Uh, <laughs> Expected to slow, slow down. down. In my life. No way. Um, we were working on. Um, protein structures and particularly how proteins fold. Ah, yeah. And there's one particular aspect of protein folding, which is important for a lot of proteins, uh, which is they form chemical bonds between amino acids in the protein that are very far away from each other. They're called disulfide bonds. Oh, right. And they lend a lot of stability to proteins, particularly ones that are secreted out of the cell, like the problem we were working uh -huh. with uh -huh. earlier. Uh -huh. um, and over the years, we've, we, uh, with the, we discovered the mechanism whereby these bonds form and then began to look at different bacterial organisms to find out whether they all did it the same way or whether there were different enzymes in each organism to make these disulfide bonds. And we found something that surprised us, and that was that they, they did differ in bact amongst bacteria. And not to go into detail, but out of that we discovered a way to look for uh, antibiotics that would inhibit the process of protein folding oh. because bacteria yeah. secrete a lot of proteins or have a lot of proteins on their cell surface that are very important for uh, killing people or killing mm -hmm. organisms. That is, they make toxins mm -hmm. that are stabilized by disulfide bonds. Um, they make adhesins which allow them to attach to human cells, for instance, mm -hmm. that use that are proteins that have disulfide bonds. So if you could stop the bacteria from making disulfide bonds in their proteins, then you would be stopping the bacteria mm -hmm. from making things that are very important for them in causing disease. So as a result of that, just in the last sort of three or four years, we've ended up with some nice genetic approaches that allow us to readily look for antibiotics that inhibit the process. So we're now in the some, doing something I never imagined I would do because I'm, bas I'm a basic scientist. Exactly, we basic so research. you weren't expecting to yeah. do But I think it's actually, but, but it's yeah. a, 
I think it's a very good example of how people doing things Abs- in yeah. na- not necessarily obscure regions, but things that don't seem to lead right. to applications right. can very quickly um, lead to important societally important uh, findings. Yes. Um, in, in, in would this affect if you you would develop antibiotics, you're saying that would uh, uh, use this mechanism. Uh, but would you also have um, a problem with uh, mutations with with the you know with the antibiotics? Would that that resistance. cause a problem? Resistance. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they, I mean, that I mean, doesn't, that is a, that it doesn't is a eliminate huge, that's, that problem. I mean, w- the reason generally it's important that a lot of people are working on antibiotics and at the moment yeah. is that organisms of bacteria have become very resistant right. to a lot of the uh, antibiotics that exist. Um, so people are talking about using combinations of antibiotics right. because then it's harder for them to resist two very different antibiotics. But, yeah, right. But this one, um, this is also a different approach in that it it doesn't necessarily stop the growth of the bacteria in every case, yeah. but it prevents the bacteria from producing these toxic proteins for humans or whatever they're infecting. Right. Right. Um, so they can still grow and therefore there may not be selection for resistance because you're, you're not necessarily exactly. killing them. Exactly. Yeah. They're yeah. sort of neutralized. So it's, it's, it's not our idea, but yeah. it's a new approach that right. people are talking right. about now. But so people are trying to come up with lots of novel approaches right. for, for getting Right, but that's interesting. You would end up in, uh, in something like this, right. uh, a bit far removed from what you had mm-hmm. started from, but in any case. Now, I'd like to go, since you were so well known as an activist, and go back to 1969 here when mm-hmm. you announced that uh, uh, the, the isolation of the gene, and it was a very big deal because of something you did at that time in cautioning where mm-hmm. this could go. And I'd like to talk about the reaction, why you did that, and the mm. reaction to it. Um, I think a lot of it was the reason we called this press conference and not only talked about the work we'd done, but mm-hmm. also for the second part of the press conference talked about our concerns, uh, reflected the fact that at that time, U.S. society and, and many other countries were in a turmoil over, for instance, the Vietnam War yeah. and in the United States, other issues, civil rights, etc., um, demonstrations in the streets all the time, etc. Um, and also that was influencing at least some scientists who were speaking out. Uh, mm-hmm. It largely began with scientists who were concerned about testing of atomic weapons. And I, I think that had, bi- had a big influence on biologists, at least some of the biologists, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. about where was their science going and what were the potential dangers mm-hmm. of it. So it was in that uh, context that we felt it was important uh, because we felt there was an issue related to the government and the way it was, what kind of science it was funding and what it was using the science for. And in many cases, we thought it wasn't for such good purposes. Yeah. So what was the reaction to that within the scientific community? So some scientists were behind, Mm -hmm. you know, in certainly in this area, I I think, uh, because I think we talked about before that the Union of Concerned Scientists started up then a number, I think maybe physicians for social Mm -hmm. responsibility Mm -hmm. may have a number of these groups of uh, professionals that were very worried about where their scientific efforts might lead inadvertently. That was not their their aim. But in the academe, when you really got into this, the next move was a little, you know, more more activist, mm-hmm. not just speaking out like this. Was there a reaction? I think uh, there was a pretty, like a cleavage to some extent between younger scientists who were more immersed yeah. in the protests, etc., and older scientists um, two reasons. There was a sense of scientists are, are ivory tower people. Yes, in their, and they certainly in their were at uni- Harvard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, they should be free to continue their work without having to worry about other things. That yeah. was society's yeah. problem. Even though they might be doing the work that's causing one of society's yeah. problems. Um, furthermore, I think the, well, 
I don't think, I clearly got messages from some of the older scientists that, that it was not a good thing to do because it might make science look bad and uh, that might lead to cutting back on funding of science. Yeah. Um, which I found very dismaying that yes, yes, you're right about those things, but um, you're, you're going to cause problems for d the development of science. Right. So it's more sort of self-interest issues. But there were a lot of younger scientists who were becoming involved yeah. at that time yeah. before. Uh, th that was the first, um, really the first thing I ever got involved in that was political, but also was political connected to science. And other students that, that year of 1969 at MIT had held a big strike and, yeah, uh, about some of the kinds of things that MIT was doing with war, the development right. of, of military right. uh, weapons. We, that's a, the thing is we associate this much more with students than with, say, faculty. But in that time, there was a lot of faculty upheaval and uh, support uh -huh. for these concerns also, I, I think, right? I'd like to go back for just a minute here. You were, your concern about the misuse of genetics um, in this case was grounded, I think, in a history in the United States and elsewhere in the world about the misuse use of inheritance. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us anything about that? And I'm, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm thinking of the eugenics mm -hmm. movement in this country and also in that period when you're, what you're uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, the overt racism that was scientifically uh, mm -hmm. presented at that time. Can you tell us about it? I, when we called the press conference, actually, I don't think we were that aware of the history. Ah, we were to uh, some extent. Yeah. Uh, but what happened was, once you get public, you have to explain what you're saying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we were worried, I think at the time, about the possibility of, of taking genes, human genes, and engineering humans for various mm -hmm, negative mm -hmm, purposes. Mm -hmm. um, but very quickly, I realized I had to know more about what, what the hell I was talking mm -hmm, about. Mm -hmm. And so I started to read a lot and discovered very quickly the, the history of the eugenics movement in the United States, uh, which began in the early, beginning of the 20th century uh, and spread to many countries, uh, including? Uh, including Germany, yeah, ultimately. Right. Um, but what happened in the United States in the early part of the 20th century was the eugenics uh, movement, which included the support of many scientists at the time who mm -hmm. really believed in the, the theories that were being put out that they were people with inferior genes and people with superior genes. Obviously, the people who are making a lot of money and richer must have superior Absolutely. genes, and the ones <laughs> who aren't making so much money don't. Um, and so they got... a. They were successful at getting a number of different laws passed, like um, laws against marriage be between people of different yes. racial groups, yeah. uh, at uh, sterilization of people who had low IQs, which was, it was argued was genetic, and in an attempt to breed a pure race in the same way that eventually exactly. the Nazis made it yeah. even much more right. explicit than in the United States. But it start, really started in the United States. And some of the laws that were passed like in 1907, 1908, were laws that were provided as models for what the, the Germans did mm -hmm. actually decades, mm -hmm. decades later, right. uh, later than it was done in the United States. Um, and most of the res quote research, I use quotes because it wasn't good research, um, in that field of genetics and, and human behavior um, was done in the United States mm -hmm. and passed on. Mm -hmm. Again, was provided the source for arguments that were made in other countries right. for eugenics. Do you think that has anything to do with our immigrant history? Because a lot of that was imposed on these very poor immigrants that were met with IQ tests at Ellis uh -huh. Island and these other entrance points, and they were all considered deficient, mm -hmm. right? Uh, do you, do you, would it have anything to do with that? Uh, or? Sure it would. Um, I I, I've said the eugenics movement, but the eugenics movement also was supported by research that came out of universities. Oh, yeah. And uh, one of the people, uh, 
Herbert Goddard, yes. who's a psychologist, did a lot of studies on immigrants coming to the United States, giving them IQ tests when they came having different languages. And they were very illiterate com- very and poor. And, and the science itself, if you yes, read about it, was yeah. incredible. But, uh, and then he argued that s- something between 70 and 80 percent of immigrant groups that were coming from Southern and Eastern Europe yeah. were uh, idiots. Yes. I mean, that was a, a technical term in Oh, those did days. he use the term? Oh, how Morons about that? and yes. idiots, I, yes. can't, I can't remember. Yes. But that they were genetically defective in intelligence. And that was part of the argument in 1924 for a law that actually reduced immigration from Southern and Eastern. And imposed, uh, uh, what would you call, quotas, quotas for, quotas for, for, for different and, groups yeah. and stuff. Right. Right. Uh, but uh, it's... So th- this, what's really important about that to me, and I don't want to forget to say it, is that it's something that is, as scientists, we never learned. I mean, I, took, I did take a right. genetics course in graduate school. I never heard of yeah. eugenics. Right. And up until, I'd say, probably the 1980s, uh, geneticists in this, this country had never heard of it. It's become a much more well-known, I think, because of a lot of the activism over the years, mm-hmm. over these issues. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe when, with like uh, Jensen and his, uh, uh, his overt racism, and, but it was all doctored up with the IQ test to cover that, uh, uh, brought it back. Uh, maybe people became mm-hmm. more aware of it, just what this is, is going on. And uh, it's still with us, obviously. Mm-hmm. It's, still, it's still with us. I think that you wrote uh, maybe about Pellegra also, which was a wonderful example of how this misuse could come about, but that's a, a disease that people are not familiar with. Can you tell us about I, that one? Yeah, I don't remember all the details, yeah. but it's a vitamin, but, but, yeah. vitamin deficiency, right, right? And people are pretty sick from it, and, right. and not not very functional. And it was mostly poor people who yes. had the disease. So there was a debate that went on. Uh, that was the genetics versus environment debate. There was a, a I've forgotten the. Somebody named Goldberger, I forget which side yeah, he was on, uh, yeah. but um, one of the scientists um, argued that it was genetic, and these were genetically defective people. Right. And the other argued, with, with evidence, because he changed people's diet and, and things improved, that it was dietary. And he lost. The, the, the argument that it was genetic won, and it was persisted oh. for for decades. Oh, I didn't realize until, that. Maybe until the third, 19th, so this is going back to 19, World War I time. Right. That, in that, when in that a lot of people period. would have had a niacin, I think it's niacin uh-huh. deficiency, and this has an effect on cognitive mm-hmm. development and cognition right. period. Right. And so it's very easy to say, see, they're, they're deficient, right. and so, since they're poor. So it yeah. was, it was yeah. accepted knowledge in the government and government committees and health care workers right. that this, right. this c- considered this problem. Um, and today we know. <coughs> yeah, I right. mean, there's nobody that argues but I, it anymore. But I'm surprised that the myth <coughs> was sustained for so long. Yeah. That's that's right. That's a quite yeah. amazing thing. Now, so gen- it was very much an era when genetics, the laws right. of genetics, were discovered at the very beginning of the 20th century. Yeah. It, in a way, it's very much like the era after the human genome was sequenced in 2000 when everyone was talking about genes expla- explaining Still everything are, again. yes. And that was happening back then. Yeah. Um, to be fair to the geneticists of the time, eventually, kind of very much too late, they realized, wait a sec, this is going too far. These genetic arguments are wrong, and, and uh, we don't support them. Right. But it was well after all these laws had been passed. Well, here's one. This is very widespread now. I mean, as you say, everybody's invoking genes for, I don't know, if you have a hangnail, it's because of genes. But the, but the other thing is that, y- that you pinned, and I would like to know if it's widespread in the genetic science community, is you tackled things like sociobiology and What's the other one? Evolutionary psychology, some psychology of some <coughs> derivative of, or other. Tell us about that, would you? And then I'd just like to know if, if, uh, if other geneticists are worried about this too. 
worried about the uh, that it has become very fashionable to use sociobiology and there are a couple of very famous scientists uh, who invoke this mm -hmm. that were rather like the ants or right. something <laughs> so not actually being in the field of evolutionary biology right. which is the basis of, of sociobiology I wasn't really aware that it was a, a, a growing field and so the first time I heard of it was uh, opening up the New York Times one morning in 1975 and seeing this front page article saying we have a new science which explains everything, everything. <laughs> <laughs> the science of everything yeah um, and I was kind of stunned yeah. and called up a friend of mine who is an evolutionary biologist Richard Lewontin I said what what is this I mean I, I thought we were finished with these kind of silly, yeah. silly things he said no uh, I won't say what he called Edward O. Wilson but <laughs> um, he said no he's been he's been into that for a long time yeah. making, making these arguments that evolution has selected for uh, males and females to be I, play very different yeah, roles and yeah. they can't function in science or or, yeah. or business and things like that that racism is innate um, and on and on and, and on. behaviors all sorts criminality yeah. I, well I don't know about criminality yeah. in that case other people made that argument so it was more sort of general what is human nature right. was the argument of sociobiology and um, he's so we agreed that there was a there was no really strong basis for this extraordinary front page story in, in the New York Times and we got together a group of people a lot of from different fields anthropology biology paleontology um, genetics etc mm -hmm. uh, and we spent a summer reading the book to find out what the, how does he say this and we eventually wrote a critique that caused quite a stir because we found it yes was that the letter in the New York Review of Books? New York, just, yeah. New York Review of Books, yeah, right. right. Um, so that, that story, I mean, it's still sociobiology. It, sociobiology itself is the study of animal behavior, for the most part. It's, it's very the, little direct yes. studies with um, humans, and then it's transferred what they find in animals the, I, from yes, to, see, to humans. Right, right. But then there are interesting things that came out of it. One of uh, Wilson's former students was uh, a woman um, anthropologist who studied uh, monkey behavior. And she published a book which is kind of extraordinary. I think it's really quite interesting to read because she looked at the conclusions that were drawn by studies of male primatologists versus female primatologists. And what she concluded was that the males simply ignored the behavior of females, <laughs> monkeys, of what of <laughs> different species of monkeys, mm -hmm. and it just showed how the the bias, the biases, unconsciously presumably yes. affected right. the scientists who were doing right. this work, uh, and it was just such a strong example of how um, that it's a problem when you're dealing with social, human social behavior to abstract yourself and be truly objective about what's what you're observing. Right. I hope, though, that geneticists like you will get out there and sort of shake things up a little bit because it's very easy uh, and, and there's a, there are a couple of new books out. We were talking about one of them just recently. Mm -hmm. We're back to this thing. Uh, first of all, uh, races matter, and there are these distinctions. And I thought we were through with this a long time ago, but it's back. So I uh, hope that the geneticists will uh -huh. get out there and get vocal again. I would like to ask you about the recombinant DNA a little bit too mm -hmm. because that also has led, that's been a really difficult thing. First, what is it mm -hmm. and why were you worried about it? When the recombinant DNA, it's another interesting social history of scientists. Um, this is like around 1975, 74, yeah. 75. Uh, scientists started to um, make genes from different places and put them into bacteria. And, and for example, they were taking genes from cancer viruses and expressing them in the bacterium E. coli. And 
a researcher was at a conference sort of proudly announcing that he was doing this wonderful work and now we're going to be able to study cancer, which in a way it, it mm -hmm. is helpful, when a lot of people stood up and said, you shouldn't be doing that without, you may be spreading cancer genes around in ways you don't want mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. by doing this. And Paul Berg was a scientist whose laboratory was doing this work at Stanford University. And he actually went along uh, eventually and agreed that this was of concern and one should start to, to look at it more carefully and to spend some time and stop the research until you have really worked this out and have reason to think that it, good reason to think that it's not going to be dangerous. Um, the thing that concerned me was more related to my 1960s, our six, 1969 press conference because now I was worried about the manipulation of human genes mm -hmm. and the possibility mm -hmm. of manipulating mm -hmm. the human genome. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point in my life, although I've changed my view of things, I felt that this research just shouldn't be done because given the history, we've, we've not used genetics in, in a beneficial way mm -hmm. often, and, mm -hmm. and there's some dangers here. Um, I think a lot of the discussion at the time was really about the health hazards, whether you were spreading cancer genes or other kinds of awful genes. And eventually that got kind of settled. There were committees set up at the National Institutes yeah, of Health right, to protect right. things. But again, it was scientists moving into an area where they didn't think ahead of what was going to happen the with what they were doing. The you implications, know. yeah, right. Um, and that's changed to some extent. I think the Human Genome Project uh, when it started in the late 1980s, uh, along with beginning to support scientific research, also put a fair amount of money into examining the potential social uh, health or health hazards of the research. Um, so th that has changed a bit. So that I, I, you know, I've been very critical of scientists in the past, but there is some degree of progress. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's just window dressing when they do things like that, but there's still there's an idea now that you have to anticipate the consequences of your work. For instance, there's a new field, apparently new field, called synthetic biology, yes. which is doing very similar things as recombinant DNA does, but in much grander ways. And they immediately started that science with ethics committees oh. about to oh, express concerns that. about it. So I think all of the activism in the 60s and 70s around all of these issues by younger scientists and people who were politicized by that era, I think has had an influence. Mm -hmm. not, to, not to say that it, things are, are perfect by any means. I think there, there are still serious problems. I was just going to say that I think that right now there's a little concern like certain industries intruding a great deal in a lot of this research and uh, they uh, it, it, you, you start getting pressured because of funding and so forth mm -hmm. to deliver some other kind of, of uh, product that you may initially object to mm -hmm. but that there is that pressure. I guess maybe that's also the military. Uh -huh. Because there's still a lot of military <laughs> yes. funding. And yes. there's an interesting article in um, Science or Nature magazine, maybe last year or a couple of years ago, a debate between two scientists about whether it was ethical to take grants from the uh, Department of Defense mm -hmm. that were asking people to develop what, was, what were called green bombs. Oh. You know what a green bomb no. is? No. A green bomb is one that, so bombs leave a lot of pollution around after they've exploded. And this is going to make the so environment So they were going to make better. the bombs better bombs because <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't, they wouldn't pollute the, you know. Non polluting bomb. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that was an, but the discussion in the article was about issues of, also of funding in science today. Yeah, where right. There's so many scientists today, the budget has really leveled off yes. if not dropped. And people are going to the right. events, and right. not that all of the re research they do is bad. In fact, they do a lot of research on, on um, diseases in third world countries because our soldiers may end up there yeah. someday. Right. 
So I, I realized I was just thinking that this the problem is still out there. The the thing, that, the question, mm -hmm. the ethics questions that you raised. Oh, maybe absolutely. that people are more conscious. You know, mm -hmm. is then the other thing that shifts that maybe is this funding issue, which pressures perhaps mm -hmm. young scientists in particular that they don't have as many options. You know, uh, uh, to say in any case, I need to to cover what you are. Uh, doing now in terms of your work on commuting, uh, communicating science to the public and of working <coughs> with students, your students, you started well, I, probably the first course on developing the sort of ethics uh, uh, consciousness uh, among students. Tell us about that, would you? Uh, it actually started, uh, this is in the early 1980s, uh, students who had taken my genetics course came to me and in that genetics course I'd give maybe a session or two discussing the so you know last session of the class might be one on ethical or social issues and the students came to me and said we really should be getting much more of that yeah. um, we'd like to have a whole course and and we'll if you'll help us we will organize it and lead the sessions so they the students actually led the sessions in the first year or something but then as time went by, we ended up doing, another professor and I from the department ended up doing, doing all the sessions ourselves. And that now covers a whole range of issues. It goes through the history of the eugenics movement. It goes through yeah. um, the history of, of ra the idea of race and, and from you know, the 18th century on and how scientists have given different views on it. Um, we look at contemporary research in these areas because these kinds of things still go on and, and make a splash. Um, we talk about science in wartime. Go over the career of J. Robert, Robert Oppenheimer, yes. and, and that's uh, yeah. just a fascinating story of the atomic really scientists is. and the mixed feelings they had about what they were doing. Um, so, which were things that influenced me as, mm -hmm, actually when mm -hmm. I was pretty young because. Robert Oppenheimer was very famous and well known back and because of he and he had a real conscience yeah and the conscience uh, hurt him I mm -hmm. mean it, it mm -hmm. uh, he got removed from yeah. the committee that was supervising it because of his concerns about how how atomic energy was going to be used um, and I think that's an a interesting example to see what uh, sci a sci an example of a scientist who has thought thought about these issues Yes. Uh, so the course still runs, yes. correct? And you are also engaged beyond that, but uh, I would like to put on the event page, on your event page, then I'll make sure if I don't have it there now, the, the name of the course, but it sounds like one of those courses that should be online for the whole world at uh -huh. this point, because I think a lot of people would really like having this, that mm -hmm. not just students in university, but the public at large, it, you know, the, the MIT and the Harvard online course mm -hmm. uh, thing would be just, just great. But in any case, you also are engaged with another group in terms of uh, putting out information for people. Can you tell us briefly about that? And there are, uh, right now, there are a couple of things that are engaging me outside of the like laboratory. Yes. <laughs> it's a little bit much, but um, I've been cooperating, collaborating with people at Kalamazoo College in Michigan on a website where we've started to collect courses like this from around the country and um, cataloging them on the, putting them on the website so that people can access these courses. My problem is finding other scientists who, I can get find courses that deal with many of the issues I right, deal with, right. but overwhelmingly they're more from sociologists yes, and anthropologists yeah. and history of science right, people. Right. Not that there aren't some from, from scientists also. Right. Um, so we're developing that, that as a place and hopefully, and Kalamazoo has a um, center called the Center for, um, for uh, Social Justice uh, Leadership and they're interested in, in working with us to really spread the word more about these kinds of courses and to push for it's being something ideally universally that scientists should be, uh, in addition to their science, right. in their science courses, they should be getting 
exposure to what it means to be a scientist in terms of potential social consequences in your yes. science itself or in your f the because field of science. Because it's a scientific era, right. right. It's a, a yeah. whole new thing. If you, uh, if there's a way to link to that or to give people that link via the event page, let me know and uh -huh. I'll make sure I, that we we'll, because yeah. I think yeah. people would be very interested. Tonight we have uh, a group of students from a local college and I know that they're eager to ask to talk with you and ask them questions and so forth. So I am sorry that I have to end there. I could talk about this all night. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate your talking with us. You're coming here and talking with us. And I will now, I'll pull back and let you talk with the people in the audience here. Okay. Thank you. And I'm going to move back. Hello, Dr. Redway. Hi. Um, so, yes, we have a group of students from Endicott College on the mm -hmm. shore of Boston, and uh, it's an interesting program that we have. There's a major in biotechnology, and the newest major is in bioengineering. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of synthetic biology and genetic engineering is right at the forefront of the entire program. And along with that, we have a bioethics course. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think it's very important that we have that. And it sounds like you're optimistic compared to what it was like in 1969, that there, there are these ethics committees that are tied into synthetic biology, for instance, right at the outset. But wouldn't you agree that it's also potentially much more uh, harmful, if you will, that there's a chance, there's a, a good slippery slope argument that uh, things could be out of control, and that, that there is a need for professionalizing bioethics? There's a need. For, so first of all, I may have sounded optimistic, but I very much agree with what you're saying. It's overwhelming how fast things are progressing and how hard it is to keep up with them. Um, at the same time, there's still a sector, a, a hefty sector of the scientific community that really doesn't believe in, in um, I found this in the Human Genome Project where they talk about we don't need philosophers or other people telling us what to do, we, we know what to do. And I think that's a, a big problem in it, that the development of ethics or whatever you want to call it or concerns about, the, about potential dangers of, of research um, should involve people other than just scientists talking to themselves. And I, th I think that happens too often. So yes, I'm optimistic because it was nil. It was null. When I started in science, there was no discussion at all of these issues, and it's, that's changed a lot. So that's, hopefully, uh, will expand in some way. Do you want to respond to that? or? Well, I just, I just know that um, it, it, it's, it, there's this whole idea of the progress trap that um, have you ever seen the documentary Surviving Progress by any chance? Mm -hmm. they, they describe a progress trap and the most simplified version of that is when the caveman figured out how to run a, a, a whole pack of mammoths off of a cliff instead of just hunting one at a time. And they found this great solution to find a source of food, but they also wiped out the food at the mm -hmm. same time. And this, this idea of a progress trap could be what we're all sort of in the middle of all the time. I know you've been on the forefront of you know, challenging that and looking for checks and balances. And I wonder sometimes, even teaching in this program, um, you know, where things might go and, and mm -hmm. where are the checks and balances? It, it seem, and typically these things come down to politics, right? So whether the Republicans are in office or the Democrats are in office, there's going to be different ethics boards who are kind of De declaring what our values are in the United States. So mm -hmm. it's a scary situation, and I wonder what you foresee with you know people like Craig Venter synthesizing whole organisms and so forth. Uh, I'm not sure I want to take Frank Craig Venter very seriously. Um, there's a lot of PR stuff associated. I don't know if you've read, uh, one of my colleagues at Harvard Medical School has talked about uh, breeding Neanderthals. Have you, uh, yeah. you read about that? Yeah. And I'm not sure why he's doing it. I'm not sure he ever wants to do it, but um, I, I don't know. Um, 
I, I, to me, the biggest problem today is global warming, and that's where I think the th issues you're raising are really important. Well, right. On the flip side of the Craig Venter issue is that his argument would be that um, the whole point of this is not to clone human beings and to use eugenics to design the, the best babies and so mm -hmm. forth, but it's to develop um, chemical products and drugs and things in yeast or bacteria or something in a very rapid um, production process that without synthetic biology we couldn't really do. So there's this wonderful potential for bioengineering, mm -hmm. but there is also this potential um, slippery slope argument mm -hmm. that people are going to do the wrong thing. And the question is, where are the checks and balances? Have you, I mean, there are meetings of this ethics group on synthetic biology. If you, I don't know if they're, what they're deciding is available or not. Do you, you haven't seen it? No, I haven't seen yeah. anything like that. But I know that they, that's part of, it, ethics sections have become part of professional society meetings. Sometimes they may not be terribly meaningful, and I've never had the time to look at what's happening with synthetic biologists. I think that if, um, like, if people were to um, make uh, to alter human genes in order to give more favorable characteristics, wouldn't that eventually narrow um, down the differences between people? Would that affect evolution in a way? Make us less likely to be able to adapt to like a change? Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the big problems that people talk about in that case is that it's going to cost money to do this kind of thing. And who will be able to afford it? I mean, I guess if the government decided that ev they would change everyone genetically, it could happen, but I don't think that's going to happen. And what people worry about is that it will, in fact, separate people more and more. Uh, if It's a little bit, to, to me, talking about science fiction, because, for instance, uh, at this point, there's no reason to think one is going to be able to introduce genes into people that will affect a cognition, intelligence, et cetera, or a lot of other issues that people talk about. Um, it, they're, it's hard enough for uh, people. One of the big failures of, of genetics recently is that all of the arguments that came out of, particularly out of twin studies, which people like Arthur Jensen carried out, which said that, oh, IQ is highly genetic, and they'd actually give a figure, it's 80% genetic. When people have gone to look for genes, basically they haven't found them. They've found very, very rare things that have very small effects uh, and don't at all add up to the kinds of things that have been claimed for twin studies. So I think we're in an era where geneticists are following the work that's been done in twin studies on genetics, which has some very serious flaws, and they're discovering that maybe the genes that supposedly existed for criminality or intelligence, et cetera, simply don't exist. That's not to say that there's no genetic effects on people's behavior, but I think there are blanket kind of conclusions that were made by the field of behavior genetics about uh, the uh, overall intelligence and, and, in, and its genetic basis. Same question. So earlier you were talking about how the Stanford University um, scientists ended up studying the uh, cancer genes and putting them into E. coli. Do you really think that the cancer genes would end up spreading much faster, or do you think something much worse could have happened? I never was particularly worried about it because I felt that um, you're actually probably causing a problem for the bacteria. They probably won't grow as well when they have extra genes in them from other organisms. Um, nevertheless, people did worry that somehow if well, these experiments were always done with the bacterium E. coli, which is a big inhabitant of the human gut. So people in general have E. coli in them and could be infected with an E. coli which becomes part of their gut. Uh, it's possible that the cancer genes could uh, be released and somehow integrated into a chromosome and affect uh, the potential for cancer in individuals. I, I didn't think the scenario was very likely. Um, was, that, was that the question you were asking? Yeah. 
but it was worth pursuing to make, uh, first of all, make people uh, feel better about it. Now this kind of research has been going on for decades and there's no indication that anything like that has ever happened with any of the, um, the bacteria that have been made. And there are uh, regulations developed that allowed, that allowed one to pursue the research if it was done under very strict um, conditions where the bacteria was unlikely to escape. Is it getting out of scale here so that there's a gene for every imaginable thing? Even in cancer, they're looking, you know, a specific gene causes something. Is that, uh, has that gotten out of whack? Well, it's gotten out of whack, but mainly out of twin studies or studies that are not the contemporary gene hunting studies. So if you, you look at the literature now, they, there, there were a lot of early successes with diseases that have straightforward, clear inheritance like sickle cell anemia, um, cystic fibrosis, et cetera, et cetera. And you'd read all the time all these discoveries. But uh, when they go to a lot more common diseases, um, they are not finding lots of genes that would explain it, the diseases as, as largely genetically based diseases. For the most part, they're saying, well, they, we're doing something wrong. They're not saying, well, maybe, maybe in fact, there aren't, that environment plays a more important role than we thought, which surprises me. I just think people would, and I think it's partly based on the fact that people, people doing this genetics with DNA, the molecular biologists, don't read the twin studies, they just read their conclusions and take, take it on faith that the genetic arguments made by uh, these uh, people doing uh, twin studies are, are good scientists. We're gonna stop at this point. We're about out of time. But when we turn on the lights, you should feel free to go and talk to Dr. Beckwith. You don't have to be shy or anything like that. I'm shy too, so. He's shy too, so you can all be shy together. But the lights will be on and you relax, get up and, and go and talk to him and that stuff, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.